where we look at the, the risks posed by the many geophysical things that happen down there. And I'm the, uh, I'm the guy that goes into the erupted volcanoes to collect the samples. Um, and then finally, I was uh, an executive in residence at California Polytechnic University uh, in San Luis Obispo. Our peer reviewers are, um, we have two of them. John Martin, who is here tonight, has his PhD in Urban and Environmental Studies, a Master's in Economics, as well as an MBA, and his bachelor's degree was in Geology. Um, you can read a lot of his qualifications in the, the report itself. The one I'd like to point out uh, as most relevant for, um, for this peer review that he conducted is that he was the point person for the technical studies on all aspects of hydraulic fracturing that supported the state of New York's review, their environmental impact statement of the effects of hydraulic fracturing. So John Martin represents the person who has perhaps the widest uh, range of knowledge of the effects of hydraulic fracturing in this same context that we're working here. And I think we're very lucky to have him as a peer reviewer. Um, Peter Muller, uh, PhD, he's also a certified uh, professional geologist is a professor of geology and former department chair at the State University of New York at Alianta. So now we're still in kind of the process part of the, uh, of the talk. I'll try to keep you up to date in that. And overall, the, the objectives of the study are to provide factual information that's been peer reviewed on the effects of hydraulic fracturing at the Inglewood oil field. Most of the discussions across the country have so far called for the need to have peer-reviewed studies of the environmental impacts, and there aren't very many out there. To my knowledge, this study that looks comprehensively at the environmental effects at particular hydraulic fracture um, jobs is the first of its type in the country. And then the, the other objective, of course, is to satisfy the settlement. So in preparing this, we, um, you know, I was given the, the charter as the independent expert to, to develop this study based upon the requirements of the settlement agreement. And so I first looked at it based on my knowledge of the process and uh, the potential impacts and developed a scope for my study. I then presented that to, to some of the members here. I recognize some of the people from the meeting several months ago. And the input that I received then caused me to expand the scope of my study to include additional areas. And then in order to support it, it was very important to me that this be firmly grounded in data. Uh, that's something that's really missing from a lot of these studies. And most of the data that we have, we were able to collect a, a baseline before any activity. In some cases, we were able to measure during the hydraulic fracturing, and in most cases, we were able to measure afterwards as well. And in order to collect this much data, it required the contribution of a, a number of different groups, contractors, as well as Caltech. And so those results are all brought together in this single hydraulic fracturing report. But if you go onto the website, the supporting studies are also available there. So first, um, I want to just give you a very brief summary of what the findings are before I go into more of the details for the rest of this presentation. So first, for the, the water-related topics like hydrogeology, water use, water quality, this was a topic that I knew was important and I had scoped a fairly large study for this, but the, the degree of um, interest and concern by the community caused me to expand this further. And our results looking um, before, in some cases during for this, but for the most part after, did not detect any effect of the hydraulic fraction. The next two issues have to do with the, the process itself of hydraulic fracturing and the effect on the wells that are used for the hydraulic fracturing. And the containment looks at the question of, did the hydraulic fracturing affect the zone that you thought it would? So we have a lot of information related to that. As well as the integrity of the well. Was there any damage to the well? 
the next four topics I, I generally group under the category of um, ground movement. They include slope stability, subsidence, ground movement, and induced seismicity. And again, studies showed that before and after uh, there was no effect uh, notable of the hydraulic fracture. The next two are um, more air related, both methane and air emissions. And um, I'll go into these in more detail during the uh, presentation itself. Noise and vibration were an area of community concern, especially, and we had studies directed specifically to that. And finally, uh, community health. Now, for the community health part, I relied upon the Los Angeles County uh, Department of Public Health study. That was completed before the two high volume hydraulic fraction studies that are the primary subject of this study. However, as uh, I'll relate a little later, uh, what we call conventional hydraulic fracturing has already occurred at the field since 2003. And so that activity was ongoing during the period that this study uh, addressed. And then finally, I think at this point I'd like to mention that there's the studies that we've conducted and summarized in this report, and some of which includes about six months worth of data. Um, and then there's a lot of ongoing monitoring that will continue to provide information on this. So um, I, live, I live in Santa Monica, and when I uh, take my bike ride down on the beach, I'll go by Venice Beach, which is shown there. Uh, however, that's in 1930. And uh, nowadays it looks a little different. But this, this speaks to a fact that I, I don't think a lot of people are really aware of. But that for its size, the Los Angeles Basin is the richest oil deposit in the world. So there's some larger fields, but the concentration of oil here is greater than anywhere in the world. And so this one would then expect to see uh, manifestations of this. And of course we have the, the La Brea tar pits, um, there's oil seeps in many parts of the area, and if you like to sail, there's a few places where you can detect the off-gassing from methane deposits out there. And so our, our urban environment has been overlaying on this richest of oil deposits. Another uh, background item is that um, in the yellow circle is shown the, um, the hydraulic fraction that we'll be looking at in this study. But there's been other hydraulic fracturing in the last year and a half in Southern California as well, as the deposits continue to be studied and developed using this new, uh, these new approaches. So that, that is the process part of the talk. And now we're going to move into the part that's more having to do with what's going on in the subsurface, the geology and um, what the actual effects of the hydraulic fracturing were. Oh, I got a little bit more, sorry. That's why I wasn't able to turn around. Okay. So this, uh, this by light, there's one more bit of uh, process here. Um, the Inglewood oil field does have a, a significant amount of environmental regulations, as all oil fields do. But this also has the overlay of the Community Standards District. And then now, in addition, there's the results of these hydraulic fracturing study that, as I said earlier, rests upon this base, but adds additional information specific to this activity. Now we're going down into the subsurface. So first I'd like to just uh, use this very simplified diagram to briefly discuss how hydraulic fracturing works. You showed us the simplified one several times. When can we see the real one? That's, uh, that's coming up next. I'm boring to death with it, but I'll try not to. Um, so with this, we have about 500 feet depth on this depiction is the freshwater zone. And in all parts of the world, as you go deeper, the water becomes more saline, and it's known as formation water. And it just has to do with really the heat and leaching of metals from the rocks that occurs naturally. 
So the, the freshwater zones tend to be shallow. And then we come down into the depth where the water producing formations are. In this particular diagram, we've got one horizontal well. And then we've got a vertical well. And I'm not going to go into it tonight. The report talks a lot about the protections that are required as part of the oil drilling process to protect the shallow groundwater zones. So know that that's in there if that's a topic of interest to you. For this, I just want to talk about the fracturing itself. So the two wells that we did at the Inglewood oil field were done on vertical wells. So like this. And then the pressure is applied here with a mixture of water and sand with about a half percent additives. We'll go into that more. And that affects an area of about a thousand feet away from the well. Now the conditions under which PXP did this work, based upon my look at the, the industry itself, were characteristic of what's known as a single stage of hydraulic fracture. So a single event of increasing the pressure and creating the fractures. In this horizontal oil, each of these would represent one stage there, 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 and on down. So in doing a multi-stage hydraulic fracturing project, you block off there so that the only place that can accept the pressure is there. You do your hydraulic fracturing project, you create your zone of fracturing, it actually goes much further into the page. The thousand feet is going into the page. And then at the conclusion, you, you draw down the pressure, you move your seals, so now you are isolating this zone with seals here and here. And then you, you do your fracture there with increased pressure. And you move down. So the study that, um, that you have before you is a study of one stage. But each stage would be bounded by that, that effect. So that, that's an important element of the, of the study. Um, okay. Now we're going to move into the, the geology itself. Um, and when I, when I approached this hydraulic fracturing study at the start, um, I knew that uh, geology is really has to be an element of what I communicate to about what's down there. I can't just gloss over that because it's so important that I need to, it's not enough for me to know about it. You need to understand it at some level. And it's a very difficult thing to depict in three dimensions uh, the subsurface geology. And so as a result, um, I recommended that Halliburton be used. Yeah. They have the state-of-the-art visualization models for this. And so they prepare this model of the subsurface. We're going to be building it up, but this is an air photo of the Inglewood oil field. We're looking approximately north. These are the wells that were used for either the high rate gravel packing, for the high volume hydraulic fracturing, or for monitoring those effects. And as we start looking into the geology a little bit more, those will be points of reference for you on each of the following diagrams. And then this is looking down at different strata as you're going down. Each colored layer is the top of a geological formation. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is start at the bottom with the very first geological unit for which we have data, or the data was available, the Sentus formation. And it's approximately 10,000 feet below the ground surface. Um, I should say, too, that uh, Halliburton was given access to um, PXP's well records, their structural interpretations of the subsurface, and so all that data from an oil field that's been in operation since 1920 was available to build this up. So it's a nice picture, but it's also grounded thoroughly in data. So down in the centers, remember I had mentioned that conventional hydraulic fracturing had occurred here since about 2003. It's this deep formation at 10,000 feet where most of that had occurred. And at this time in the LA Basin, 
the dominant uh, structural regime is of compression, of pushing together. This area has been through a lot of different motions. It's one of the more complicated areas. But at this period, it was dominantly compression. Okay, now we've, we've added a layer. This is the top of the nodular shale. The nodular shale is at about 8,500 feet depth. And it is the unit that uh, received the two hydraulic fracturing uh, jobs that are the subject of this report. <coughs> okay, now we're going to um, we're going to start building up the geology unit by unit. I'm not going to give you a, a story of each one, but uh, okay. So now this this one. Yeah. Well, the, the air unfortunately has been turned off. We were unsuccessful in trying to get it on. That was something. We probably opened the door to get some cross That's the back of the Yeah, we're trying to do it. We recognize this war. And also, uh, you know, although uh, I mentioned that uh, as a scientist you can become very uh, close to your data, and I have tried to compress this uh, as much as I thought I could without, you know, losing the value of all the data that exists. But um, you know, I am, am going to be talking to you for about 45 minutes to an hour, so that was a good point to help with the environment there. So at this point. In the uh, structural history, we've now got two thrust faults. These are the kind of faults that you get when there's compression going on. And this marks this period also marks a, a period of what we call transpression. So it's a combination of compression and lateral movement, transfer movement. And the Newport angle fault shown here is where early on a lot of that motion was accommodated motion along there. And you can see that it's cutting the thrust faults, which indicate that it's a younger fault than the, the older thrust faults. OK, so we're going to keep uh, keep building up here a little bit. Let's see the next one I want to stop at. OK, so now we're just keeping adding layers. These are primarily sandstones. There's a few shales. But these are just representative of deposition in a near ocean environment. Okay. And now we come now we come to the top of the ridge formation. This is a, a very productive uh, sandstone. It's very permeable, and so as a result, this would not be a unit that would be uh, interested in hydraulic fracture because it's so permeable already. We also have another generation of thrust faults. Another generation of thrust faults. Okay. So now with the Pico surface, the Pico formation, that's a fairly widespread unit in the Los Angeles Basin. Really all of these they are in one way or another. But the significance of the Pico formation it's a marine formation. It was deposited in the ocean. The water tends to be saline, as does all the water at deeper levels. But above the Pico, that's the zone where you can encounter fresh water, so water of low salinity. And for that reason, the Pico formation is called the base of fresh water. So I'll be, I'll be using that term later on as well. And this is our first introduction where we, where we meet the Pico formation in the base of fresh water. Um, as you'll see, we've done um, extensive studies of the occurrence and the quality of groundwater beneath the Baldwin Hills. We've drilled, um, either as part of previous studies or as part of this study, uh, 19 wells that are focused on collecting and analyzing groundwater samples. Uh, at almost half of those, we don't encounter water at all 
when we drill from the surface down approximately 500 feet to that base of fresh water, the top of the Pico Formation. Where we do encounter it, it tends to be discontinuous. It occurs at different levels depending on what level that you're in. And so in this diagram, these represent the areas where we actually do encounter some groundwater. Okay. Now I've uh, added this hydrocarbon steel. This is the Pico formation here for reference, and so it goes above and below. Within the Pico, there is some there is some oil within that zone. But in general, this hydrocarbon seal is the reason that there's an oil field here and not the upper Antarctic. That seal has allowed oil to accumulate beneath it. It's formed what's known as a trap. And beneath that trap, this one consists of both faults acting to stop the rise of oil as it comes up, as well as uh, relatively impermeable shale deposits. And so that seal is um, significant not just for the formation of enough oil that one would come to uh, extract it, but it also provides uh, an additional protection between the shallow resources and the deeper resources, something that you don't see in areas where there's active oil seeps. Okay. So that, um, that's our geology. We'll be returning to that as well. Uh, but, but I just wanted to take the time to, to introduce that because it's, you know, just throwing that first one up, it's hard to get what's going on. But uh, hopefully that's helpful. It's about 718, and you made it sound like at 730 we'd be getting to the questions because we have to leave at 830. So you have maybe 12 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to go more than that. Okay, <laughs> but I'm just reminding you. Thank you. I'll count on you for that. I think you reminded me when I was <laughs> going off on my uh, qualifications the first time, too. Trustworthy soul of you are. And, okay, so now we're, now we're going to move into the um, actual looking at the hydraulic fracturing itself. I told you a bit about the process, the geology. And now we'll look at the, the two high volume hydraulic fracture pro, uh, jobs that uh, PXP conducted here and that I was monitoring. This map shows the two wells that had the high volume hydraulic fracture. These two had the high grade gravel pack, and again, that's in the report, but I'm not going to spend time this evening talking about those. <coughs> And then these three wells were used to monitor the effects of the hydraulic fracturing at depth. And I'll be showing that in the next couple of slides. Okay, so we're back to our uh, geological um, model here again. We've got the, I've taken away the ground surface and just left the, the top of the Pico formation here, the base of fresh water where we've uh, found groundwater. And then from that Pico formation down to where the hydraulic fracturing occurred here is about uh, 7,700 feet, about a mile and a half. And then compared to the ground surface, it's about 8,300 feet or so. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to zoom in here and look at the effects of the hydraulic fracturing itself. So each of these little dots, or spheres, if you will, are um, micro seismic events that were measured in those in one of those three wells that were located near the two that we actually did the hydraulic fracturing on. The magnitude, so the earthquake magnitude, so you know the, the Northridge earthquake, for example, uh, was a 6.4 magnitude. These were magnitudes between minus two and minus three. 
The magnitude that you would feel, it depends on your sensitivity a bit, but in general, the magnitude that you would feel is a magnitude three. And the reason it's called a magnitude scale is that each number is a factor of 10. So compared to what you would feel, these earthquakes are about 100,000 times smaller. And so as a result, they're known as micro seismicity. So each of these is one of those events. The color just refers to at what time it was actually. And then these kind of the blade-like structures are the, um, the calculated uh, area in which the sand and water that was injected as part of the hydraulic fracturing actually occurred. So what you see here is that within the, the nodular shale, within the target formation, the, the sand that was injected stayed within the nodular shale. You see down here, there was some micro seismicity that occurred outside the nodular shale. But as soon as the pressure is released, and the actual process of high volume hydraulic fracture takes less than an hour in terms of the overpressure. And once that pressure is released, all those fractures reseal. So you have to get the sand in there to actually prop them open. So this is just a depiction of where there was an effect in the subsurface. Another thing that was part of the hydraulic fracturing itself were the fluids used during hydraulic fracturing. In the, um, the period of about three, four years ago or so, when hydraulic fracturing kind of entered the, the national um, consciousness, the, the fluids that were used were considered to be a proprietary um, trade secret by the companies that actually provided them. And that, of course, led to a lot of skepticism. Now, there's a much more disclosure. And both in the report itself and on the website, frackfocus.org, shown at the bottom there, uh, you can find the, the actual chemicals that were used during these two that, uh, that PXP conducted. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one. So this, this shows a list of what was used. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I do want to go back. One point I failed to make here is that about 99.5%, um, almost all, of what gets injected in order to increase the pressure for the hydraulic fracturing is water and sand. The water carries the sand with it and when the fractures are opened up by the water, the sand can then fill them in. And then at the conclusion, the water comes back up as what's known as flowback water. And then once the well is brought on to production, the net direction is pumping things out of the ground. So it all gets recovered. And in order to improve the efficiency of that process, if you just put sand in water, it'll all sink down to the bottom. So these additives are primarily serving the purpose to make the water more like a jet. And so, you know, you'll frequently see that the, the additives are used in ice cream. And this guardo is uh, actually one of those. And, uh, and, it, and it has exactly the same effect. So the, the guar gum flushes up or uh, creates more of a jelly and that holds the sand in, for, in the formation so that it can then be, uh, so that it can carry the sand out into the fractures and prop them over. So the, the report itself goes through a lot more detail on that. Okay, so that is the, uh, that is the geology and the hydraulic fracturing part. And now we're, we're coming to the, the last segment where we're going to uh, briefly summarize the environmental effects that, that we measured in the various studies. The ones in white are the ones that I'm going to talk about in, in some detail. 
the, the hydrogeology and water quality have to do with the potential effect on groundwater. Uh, the slope stability, ground movement, and induced seismicity are more geological related effects. Methane is something that came up uh, during the scoping meeting for this as an area of a lot of concern, and so we focused a lot of our study there. And then finally, briefly, I'll summarize the LA County Health Study. The one shown in the orange color, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I will speak to them briefly at the end. So one, one thing I'd just like to point out here again is that you know, there's 14 different things that, uh, in, in looking at my charge to evaluate these effects that I thought were important. And in talking to you, I increased the level of my uh, evaluation of water use and water quality, methane, <coughs> and slope stability. And so based on my experience, based on seeing what other studies are available, um, this I, I aimed to be comprehensive and I aimed to be data rich. OK, so water quality. Um, a lot of the, this, this map, this map shows the outline of the West, the West Basin Water District. And that's the location of the Inglewood oil field. So the, the provider of water to the area surrounding the Inglewood oil field is West Basin Water District. And then there's several sub sub providers that operate under their umbrella. Um, Calam Water is one of them, yeah. and you'll, you'll of course see from your bills who uh, who you get. And down below, I've given you the web address uh, for West Basin, and it's where I drew this information. And two thirds of the water that West Basin provides to the locals comes from far away. It comes from the Colorado River or it comes from Northern California in the delta of the um, Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. Uh, so those clearly would not be affected by the hydraulic fracturing that occurs here. And significantly, during the, the last public meeting, there were concerns that the, the water provided actually be tested. And West Basin is required to do that. Four times a year, they're required to do comprehensive water quality testing. <coughs> they must meet the drinking water standards in the water that they provide. And the, the results are provided in that, uh, that website. And you can kind of cruise around. It's not all on that page, but that's a good starting point. The other one third comes from a mixture of local surface water supplies and local groundwater supplies. And by local, I mean the Los Angeles Basin. The closest operating well that's part of the West Basin system is a mile and a half away. And most of them <coughs> are much further away than that. And it just has to do with where the groundwater occurs. You put the supply wells where you have most of the groundwater. And if you look in the report, I've got a map showing um, where the groundwater sources are. So this, this map, we're going to stick with groundwater for a bit here. And this map shows the, the Los Angeles Basin. It comes from a recent, through a 2003 study by the United States Geological Survey looking at groundwater flow in the Los Angeles Basin. And so you can see here the different, the different basins, the West Coast Basin and the Santa Monica Basin, the Port of Fault Zone, and then here, is the Baldwin Hills. And if you look, um, I have two quotes here. One is that the USGS modeled the Baldwin Hills as what they called a no-flow cell. So in doing the groundwater um, flow model of the Los Angeles Basin, the USGS determined that there's no net flow in or out of the Baldwin Hills. And for that purposes, it was a no-flow set. They drew, the USGS drew much of that information from what well, is still the landmark study of this, the Department of Water Resources 1961 study of the groundwater resources of the Los Angeles Basin. And they stated that 
Department of Water Resources stated that the Baldwin Hills are a complete barrier to groundwater movement, where the essentially non-water barren pico formation pops out. Now remember that pico formation is the salty marine unit that underlies the fresh water. And so in places, because of the folding and the faulting, because of that geological picture that I had shown you earlier, because of that, the, the systems, the, the sands that hold groundwater elsewhere in the LA basin were uplifted, they were included in the folds and faults, and as a result, the groundwater bearing zones beneath the Baldwin Hills became disconnected from the remainder of the Los Angeles basin. And in the, um, yeah, so in the next slide, we're going to um, show not just what uh, you know, the USGS and the Department of Water Resources have presented, but uh, I'm going to present my own data that I've collected at the Baldwin Hills that include uh, a series of 19 borings where we were able to encounter water, we converted those into groundwater wells for purposes of determining the extent of groundwater and for measuring its quality. And so we're going to talk about both of those a little bit in the next. First, the extent, then the quality. Okay, we're back to our friend, the uh, geological map here. And okay, this, is our, this is where we've actually found groundwater. This again is the top of the uh, <coughs> We're zooming in a little bit. You can see the important thing of salt. And now we're just going to focus on the, uh, the Pico formation itself. So these, in all of our investigations, these occur as isolated bodies with dry, dry holes in between, literally. And for many of these, we went all the way down to the top of the Pico Formation. So if it was there, we would have seen it. We conducted uh, geophysical studies, um, electrical logs that can provide a more detailed look than the eye alone can show. Uh, so those were all parts of this study of the experiment. This is a cross section looking down into the groundwater zones themselves. This is the ground surface. This is the top of the Pico Formation, again, our base of freshwater. So this would be the zone, the freshwater zone. And this just shows in a different view than the um, fancy geological model that I showed you before, how the different water bearing zones are discontinuous and occur at different levels within, um, within that uh, zone of freshwater. These wells also, when we pump them in order to collect groundwater samples, uh, all but two of them pump dry. So in terms of what they could possibly offer as a supply, they, they wouldn't. It takes a long time just to collect samples from them. So there is no current groundwater production beneath the Baldwin Hills for water supply. And based on these direct measurements, it wouldn't serve as a water supply in terms of its yield. Now, the, uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, however, is charged with protecting, charged by law, with protecting the quality of all groundwater beneath the state of California, no matter what its extent or volume. If it's groundwater, it needs to be protected as a potential source of drinking water. So that is a water quality determination. And that water quality determination means that the groundwater needs to meet the drinking water standards, regardless of whether it could ever be used as a drinking water supply. So we're going to look here at that question. Um, so this, this shows the uh, a year's worth of groundwater monitoring. Um, there's more uh, older data available. This includes two rounds of groundwater sampling after the hydraulic fracturing. So as far as water quality goes, we have a six-month picture of how that may have been affected. What I'm showing here 
is each of these are compounds or elements that at any time have been detected, not necessarily just after hydraulic fracturing, but that were detected during the baseline period as well. This axis takes whatever the detection was, say a arsenic, and divides that value by the drinking water standard. So on this graph, here's one. So anything at one is at the drinking water standard. So the water that you sample and analyze, if that equals the drinking water standard, it would show up as one on that graph. So all of the data, with the exception of one, fall below one, and so meet the drinking water standards. Only the ones above this line do not, and the only compound that does is arsenic. The, uh, the actual data is in the report. I've tried to depict it as clearly as I can, and this is my best attempt. But uh, arsenic is the only one that's above one. And based on studies by the EPA and the Department of Toxic Substances Control, Southern California groundwater is known to have arsenic above the drinking water standard. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon. So even though the arsenic beneath the Baldwin Hills exceeds the drinking water standards, so does it elsewhere in Southern California. So as far as groundwater goes, we've talked first about its occurrence its separation from the rest of the groundwater of the Los Angeles Basin, and its relatively low yield. Here, we've shown that the, the water quality, we compared it to the drinking water standards as the, as the regional board uh, is required to do. So we're going to leave water now, and we're going to move on to ground movement. So um, as I mentioned earlier, when we were looking at the a nice geological cross or a block diagram and looking at the spheres representing the micro seismicity. Again, those were approximately 100,000 times less than an earthquake that could be felt at the surface. In fact, the only way to detect them is by placing the um, geophones, the devices to detect ground movement, deep within the wells that are nearby. Measurements of vibration that we collected at the surface, uh, the measurements of seismic uh, movements by Caltech uh, that they continuously collect with an accelerometer there at the Inglewood oil field did not detect the effects of this hydraulic fraction. So you really do have to be at this sort of depth to even see them. Based on studies by the uh, National Research Council and by the United States Geological Survey, both of which were published this year, this is relatively small force, but not enough to endure, induce tectonic earthquakes that you would feel. And uh, studies of the Newport Inglewood Fall have indicated that most of those occur in excess of three miles depth to large earthquakes. So um, in the, I'm sure you've read about the potential for reduced seismicity uh, with hydraulic fracturing and, um, in Ohio and in Oklahoma and in other areas. Uh, there is, uh, there, there have been earthquakes associated with the gas production process. The studies that I cited before, the National Research Council, the United States Geological Survey, linked those earthquakes to the injection of wastewater. So not to the fracturing itself, but injection of wastewater in proximity to a fault, and that that was the triggering effect. At the Inglewood oil field, there's been what's known as a water flood. That is, the injection of water that is produced along with the oil and the natural gas gets re-injected back into the formations um, that are oil-bearing, formations from which it came. Uh, 
at this point when um, PXP is doing their oil production, something like 90% of the fluids that come up are water. So it's really a water cycling operation. And since 1957, that water has been injected back into the formation from which it came. So injected into a formation that's been depressurized. So when you pump out the fluids as part of the oil and gas development, you decrease the pressure in the producing formation. That was, in the early days, what had led to subsidence, that depressurization. So by injecting the water into these depressurized zones, the water flood brings the pressure back up. In Ohio, in other parts of the country where the wastewater injection has triggered earthquakes, the injection is not in depressurized zones. They are in zones that are at their, if you want, equilibrium levels. So there's a bit of overpressure that goes on. So that's, that's one um, look at the uh, relationship with um, induced seismicity. The second is that the injection of water, the water flood, that's been going on at the Inglewood Field has been occurring since its beginning for about 55 years. And the, the number there, 1971, is when the subsidence was thought to be more or less equalized. So there's been the water flood going on for a long time. And if there was going to be the kind of connection that you see elsewhere in the country, it should have been seen by now. Finally, this is an area of which there's a lot of ongoing monitoring. Uh, there's ground motion monitoring, there's seismic monitoring conducted by CalCAP. And so this does get a look. So for these ground movements, the, the studies that were collected before, after, in some cases during, uh, did not detect an effect of the hydraulic fracturing with the exception of the micro seismic measurements conducted at depth, whose whole purpose was to identify those small effects. Okay, slope stability is um, something of a lot of concern to the, the people who live around the Baldwin Hills. And um, in, my, uh, in my work, this, this study, Slope Stability and Geology of the World and the Hills, by the Department of Conservation, Division of Mines and Geology, that addresses the characteristics of the Baldwin Hills insofar as they relate to slope stability. And it, found, it finds, this study, that the combination of the steep natural slope and soft sedimentary rocks, combined with building before the current level of strict grading codes was in place, has led to a case where there can be property damage as a result of the slope instability. And at the time that study was uh, done in 1982, 21% of the properties had been damaged by rainfall-induced slope instability. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of superlatives about uh, Los Angeles. One of them, of course, is that it's the, the richest oil basin in the world. I mentioned that one. But the, the, the rates of crustal uplift combined with the soft sediments are very similar to what you see in the Himalayas, which you typically associate with one of the, the biggest mountain ranges in the world. And we've got that sort of thing here. So, you know, we can tend to, tend to forget that we do live in a natural environment. And this Division of Mines and Geology study is, is trying to make that point. And I'd like you not to forget that we want one, at least one hour, which you mentioned, and it's now 7.45. How are we going to do that? Tom, Tom, the third time you've interrupted, we are going to make an arrangement with the church to extend the meeting a little bit longer. Ah, thank you. So, I've cautioned you silently, settle down, we'll get to the question. Now I'm saying it publicly so you can hear it. Settle down, please let Dr. Torme finish it. This, this issue was a, a major issue during the CSD process, and that led to specific conditions, specific monitoring and, and inspections that are ongoing. And as far as uh, my hydraulic fracturing study goes, the, the monitoring of vibration 
which didn't detect anything about the background levels of the units. Uh, the, the, measure, the annual measurements of ground, uh, ground movement, which were conducted both before and after the hydraulic fracturing occurred, and the sub subsidence monitoring again before and after didn't detect an effect from hydraulic fracturing. So insofar as these contribute to slope stability issues, uh, we couldn't find a tie between the hydraulic fracturing and that. Okay, so we're coming to, this is the last of the issues that I'm gonna address in some detail, and then we'll have a brief wrap up. So that thing is a um, you know, major concern globally, and it's really to be, uh, it's part of living on the richest oil deposit in the world. Um, this map shows in yellow the outline of the city of Los Angeles. And where we have pink are areas that the city of Los Angeles has mapped as methane zones. So they're known to have high levels of methane at shallow levels. And uh, specific building requirements uh, come into play if you're going to do any sort of development in that area. Inglewood oil field is located there, and since it's in the county, the county doesn't have the equivalent of the city's mapping of a methane zone. But you see, we have pink there, 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 and there. So it is, it is surrounded by these. And um, in our study, we, co we collected samples of shallow soil gas and analyzed them for methane both before and after the hydraulic fracturing. And then uh, in the wells, we also collected it in groundwater after the hydraulic fracturing. And, um, yeah. So this, this shows the area of the, the methane testing, the test sites. It's fairly um, comprehensive. There's various um, requirements associated with this. Um, I don't want to go into it in a lot of detail, so I won't. And um, this, this figure shows a um,
Tom Floyd here. One of the most important things that you stressed over and over again is the integrity of the well case for how it, it stops fluids and other things of contaminating different layers. It's my understanding after reading lots of material that the whole production of oil and fracking across the nation shows that between 6 and 10 percent of the casings that are put around do not work from the beginning. 6 to 10. Now, if you've already got a thousand wells up there, and you're going to put 200 more, that's 1,200 wells. If you get 6 percent of that, that's 72 wells that are going to be leaking. And if you get the 10 percent, that's going to be 120 wells. That is not safe as far as we're concerned. That contamination is going to hurt our property. It's going to hurt our families. And we need you to show us how that is proved safe for us. Because we don't want to be your guinea pigs. And if you think that we're going to allow you to destroy our property, our family members, and our health, you're not smart. <laughs>
giving the information. And perhaps something that the XP might be able to answer more. But for the most part, I think I mentioned earlier that um, the total fluids that are pumped out of the ground, about 90% of those are water. In many cases, a higher percentage is water. And in a very real sense, the operation is a cycle of water skimming off a little bit of oil. So I'm not sure about that particular number, the total water use. I didn't get into that. But I do know that most of the water that's used in the water flood is derived from those very formations that you're, you're flooding in back in. How many dollars? I should say, Doc, Dr. Torme's uh, role uh, here this evening was talk and his retention with the NSP was to specifically look at the hydraulic fracturing issue. Understand there's a lot of questions about normal operational issues in the field outside Dr. Forme's purview and role uh, with us uh, for the purposes of this exercise. I can answer that. I looked at our operations manager. We're not sure where somebody would get 15,000 acre feet for water uh, annually to run our operations. Um, happy to follow, follow up with you uh, and you know, show a little bit more light on what our accurate water use is. Uh, again, that's just, you know, what Dr. Torme said, the majority of the water within the field for our normal everyday operation is the produced water that is sent to the water treatment plant and jacked back in to the water flooding operations. Yes, sir. Yes, as we all, as we all know, uh, Los Angeles is a, pretty much a desert, and so water is a very, very uh, prized commodity. Uh, my question is, are you going to recycle this from well to well to well, and then when you're done with it, you just go dump it somewhere, but you take all of the particulates out, take all of the stuff that's cancerous, all of the things like that, out of the water before you turn it back? That's my first question. And my second question is, most insurance companies do not insure anything that is considered God-produced or is an earthquake. Are you going to get insurance to cover all these people and all these statistics from all these studies don't have to pan out? Are you going to get insurance that isn't going to be nullified by the fact that it's an of a God, but actually have insurance that people can come to you and say, see, it didn't work out, the studies didn't work out, we are not going to sue you. We do have coverage for that. I think on the first of the two part question, uh, the, the operations of the England oil field is waterfall. And again, it's continually recycling of the water. Uh, so uh, at no point uh, do we envision it would be necessary to the way this field operates. Uh, to have a dedicated wastewater uh, system. Uh, it's just not the way this field works. It's not the way oils can come from this particular field. Like so, uh, in regards to the earthquake uh, insurance liability question, obviously, uh, you know, it's a bit of a hypothetical question. But the point of the study, the point of the study uh, was to address the policy question, the policy concern. Uh, that's been raised. There is uh, an assertion that's been made that hydraulic fracturing in and of itself as an activity will induce seismic, seismic events to the point that they A, to be felt, or B, to create property damage. You have a national study by the National Research Council that said that was the case. But in this case, the actual energy from hydraulic fracturing operations were observed and registered for the purposes of providing this data. Uh, so I, I can't really entertain a question like this because the data suggests that the data suggests well, sir. That was not the question. The, the question was if you go out and get insurance. Are you going to have insurance that's valid? So if that all these studies and all these things that you said here, they told us all these things. If it doesn't pan out, then we can sue you. Yep. I can't really speak to the last question. Obviously, well, that's one of our right problems now. with BXP. So we can't, we can't, you teach you things, and you can't go to a company or whatever. The whole point is, is that are you going to be responsible? And one of the ways you're responsible is for having insurance that we can go to and say, okay, fine, we have a claim, we'd like to take a claim. And I, and what a statement would be worth, uh, would be uh, quite, uh, uh, 
open to us is, is if you have an insurance, uh, insurance policy that we could come to in case all of these studies and all this stuff and all the best of science and yada, 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 yada if that all comes to you, it falls down the tube, then we have somewhere to go to. Or that's my hundred million dollar bond to keep up. Well, our bonding and our insurance uh, existing uh, policies that are in place, certainly well within the requirements of law, well within uh, what is standard uh, regulatory expectation for a company uh, of our size and our nature. I would like two things clarified. Uh, one is you talked about the story of chemicals that are in the water, and it, um, I'm trying to understand what happens to the chemicals even if you're recycling it, doesn't that uh, penetrate into the ground? Doesn't you know? You only talk about the water quality that exists before you start doing the fracking. But what about just the quality of the land afterwards? And then my second question is: um, Isn't all methane, regardless of the isotopic composition, still equally flammable and dangerous and explosive? For the, the first question, the, um, I mentioned that the, the idea of hydraulic fracturing is to not just inject water to cause fracturing, but to get sand into those fractures to hold them open for when you decrease the pressure. And so in order to do that effectively, that's why the, the chemicals are added, to increase the viscosity of that water so that the sand, sand stays in suspension. And there's a picture in the report of that, if you're interested. And so there, the design of that is to keep the viscosity high during the hydraulic fracturing, so you can get the sand out there. And then some of those compounds help to then break down that gel so that it, its viscosity reduces so that it actually flows back. And so that much is recovered during that flowback period. And the actual amount varies. Um, and then... Could you be a little specific about the actual amount? Like what percentage? It's about 30% is recovered as what's known as flowback. So that comes up back to the surface. So 60% of the chemicals are left in the land afterwards? So after the flowback period, when the well is brought up to production, the liquids are pumped out again. So it's all brought out either as flowback or during the production phase. So the chemicals don't go anywhere that the sand doesn't go. So that's the uh, yeah, so that's kind of the connection there. And then once they come to the surface, these fluids at the Inglewood oil field. Um, as part of the review, we looked at the, the water treatment system. And so there's, a, there's filters and there's softeners that make the water then usable to, again, be recycled in the water flow operation itself. So nothing is uh, released to the land as part of the, the process itself. It's, it's drawn from depth greater than 2,000 feet or so. In the case of the hydraulic fracture, it's greater than 8,000 feet. Uh, and then when it comes to the surface, it's treated and then re injected again. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, uh, the second question having to do with the methane. Yes, regardless of the source, the methane acts as, um, uh, and it does two things. It, uh, if a room is filled with methane, then it can cause. Uh, very flammable, and it also displaces the oxygen. So, regardless of where it came from, that's the effect of methane. And it's because of that that the city identified those methane zones on a map so that there could be specific building requirements that would um, uh, block the transport of methane. Uh, Is there a volume measurement done? Um, 
before it's pumped down, to know exactly how much blood is being pumped down, and is there a volume measurement that measures it after it's come back so that you know you've got all your water back? Yes, that's, that's part of the, the process, measure all of that. And that's in the support.